my father's pails and raise them up. Why did the mother ship her child down the stream, so to speak, without a paddle even? It was, the reason was, is because Pharaoh had astrologers and said that, listen, we know that, and they were very big in a, a astrology in those times. It's an interesting idea that even though Judaism says that people shouldn't be superstitious, uh, and therefore we don't like to hold about astrologers, nevertheless, it's a very interesting idea that there is something behind astrology, even according to Judaism, I mean. That, that astrology, there is, they, people can see in the stars to see the future. Does that mean the people that you uh, read about in the newspapers and at the drugstores that they come out and will tell your future are for real? That I don't know. And uh, probably to say that there's a, it's probably a lot of bunk, but I really don't know for sure. But to whether the ancient science of astrology was known to these Egyptians, that seems to be a fact, that they could see pretty much into the future. I see pretty much because, so to speak, and I'm not an astrologer myself and I don't know, they needed a little bit of a fine-tuning. I'll give you an example about this idea that the astrologers told Pharaoh, we see in the stars that the savior to the Jewish people, even though that they were slaves at that time, someone's going to come and save them, will be born soon. But we see that he's going to have his downfall with water. See, they saw and they didn't see. They don't know exactly what. They saw a bad thing with water. So that, uh, that's why Pharaoh said, well, the, per the boy is going to be born and going to have a downfall with water. Let's have all the Jewish boys being drowned in the Nile River. And in that way, that we're going to know that the uh, downfall of the Savior, maybe he'll have his downfall to water with the Nile River. Well, they saw and they didn't see, as I said that they saw the, the truth, that they saw that the downfall of the Savior would be with water, but what kind of water? Later on in the book of Numbers, if you remember, that Moses was told the Jewish people needed water in the desert. Uh, the Almighty said to Moses, here, uh, speak to the rock and tell them, tell the water to come out of the rock. And instead, Moses hit the rock. I don't want to get off on too big of a tangent about this story because that's not my point. This idea of the water because of hitting the rock because of the water. Instead of speaking to the rock about water, there the Moses was punished and he wasn't allowed to go into the land of Israel. And that was, so to speak, his downfall. And that's what the astrologers saw. So they saw something of the truth. They didn't understand exactly what. Now, since Moses was down the river, uh, that we see, and this is I'm, all I'm trying to tell you what the Bible itself tells, and then we're going to get into very, very interesting material about filling in between the lines. And we'll get to the point. Let me just get to the outline right away. So Moses is raised up by the daughter of Pharaoh, and the next story comes out, and he grows up, and the next scenario jumps, and he's a young man, and he sees that an oppressor, an Egyptian taskmaster, uh, beating up a, a Jewish person, what are you doing? And he kills him, and he buries his body. But uh, two, other, uh, two other people turn him in, and he has to run away from the land of Egypt because he would have been under a death sentence. Uh, and then he's about 80 years old, and we're jumping. This is exactly what the story is. You're going from baby to young man to 80 years old, where he has the vision of the burning bush and was told by the Almighty, go back to Egypt and to, uh, to re... re um, to go back to Egypt and redeem the Jewish people from their bondage. Pretty much that's all we know. I really pre pretty much told you exactly what's going to happen in the, uh, in the Bible. Now what, on the other hand, is between the lines. Now let me explain something also when you learn. That there's many, many ideas that are between the lines. That the story of any idea or any Jewish law has many, many details of how many intricate parts of any kind of law or story. Uh, the, the Bible, in a sense, is very shorthanded and very much of an outline. There's many commentaries. That's what the Midrash is talking about, the Talmud. They're trying to define. It says, for example, don't work on Sabbath. What it is, when it is, how. There's an intricate number of laws. But they are not, of course, seen in the... And the, the Bible itself, all you see is one line, don't work on Saturday, don't work on Sabbath, really. So, for example, we're going to take that idea and look at Moses also. What I told you is really the storyline of the Bible, and there's so many, so many different, uh, different information 
that that can be told about Moses. Now the reason is, it's a very interesting idea of why it says that Moses was hid for, by his mother for three months. Why three months and not less and no more? Because th that when a person became pregnant, that people would understand, or they'd have Egyptian spies or people turning them into, that they were pregnant, and they'd come back nine months to take the child away. Because obviously a child takes nine months. Moses was born premature at six months, and therefore the, the policeman didn't come after him to do anything to him for three months. Six months and three months, and then the nine months. So she hit him for three months. Now there's another interesting point. When they brought him down to the river, and Moses was actually taken by Pharaoh's daughter, what happened was that uh, Pharaoh's daughter needed to nurse, you know, wet nurse, as you call it in those days. They didn't have the formulas we have today. So what are we going to do? She called all the Egyptian nurse maids, and they couldn't, they, the, the baby just didn't want to nurse from these maids. So finally they called in, and who was it? It was actually, it says, that Moses' mother herself that actually came, that actually came and, and nursed Moses, and she was actually paid for it. So this was an interesting idea that a divine providence. Now, now we're going to talk about the character of Moses. Now, every person is a human being. Well, it doesn't sound like that's any, uh, any special news, but in, in a certain sense, it is big news, because when talking about these holy characters, holy men and women of the Bible, they're coming off, and we don't see too much character buildup of theirs. They don't talk about them so much. If you have a, a novel, we talk about, and a major idea when you write a book, of course, is to build your characters. Tell us about them, how they looked, and how they acted, and how they felt. And many pages, if you'll... If you know about writing, you know it's the truth, and if you know that this is the way of writing, and if you're reading next time, you never noticed it, see how much they tell you about the character, about the hero of the story, or some other character of the story. There always has to be character buildup. You don't see this in the Bible. So therefore, that many people say they're like automatons and robots, and they're holy people, and they don't have real human feelings. And it really isn't true at all. It's really not true. Because they are human beings. They may be holy. They may be godly. All of these characters. But on the other hand, that they were human beings. And they actually had feelings. And they had problems. And they had stresses. And they had different choices to make in life also. It wasn't so automatic that their lives. And when we see with Moses, he may be the hardest of the characters to, to try to delve in. Because look at this person. He was a, a regular person. He was a Jewish person. Now, his race, the Jewish people, were suffering terrible slavery. On the other hand, he was languishing in the, in the luxury of the Pharaoh's court. I mean, his mother was a princess. And in those days, it wasn't even today, you could understand that person is a senator and they're, they're a congressman, and you understand that they're, they have a, a, an easier uh, financial life. But it's surely in those days, with absolute monarchy, uh, that these people didn't even have to work, or they just took accounts, or it surely was a, a luxurious life, to say the least. Now, of course, this is a, sets up a tremendously interesting character model of a person who is living in the luxury of the uh, court, of the king, and on the other hand, knowing that his own personal people, the people that he is supposed to live with, on the other hand, are sitting out there slaving at the worst taskmasters. And not just a slave minimum wage we're talking about, we're talking about very, very harsh conditions. People being beaten and whipped, and they're being tortured day and night for, for, and pushed to the limit of their work. And, and here's his people working as slaves, and he's sitting here in luxury. Well, it's a very interesting role model that you can understand that any person would have to go through. And Moses, as holy as he was, and as special as he was, had to go through this problem also. And even this is, really revolves around that story that I told you. And we see as I'm bringing out to you, and what the Bible does is it takes the different major turning points of a person's life 
and bring and stresses those. Not that nothing else is important, which is of course not true. Not that there's not other major uh, happenings in their life, but on the other hand, and this is a major point that that these major turning points have to be built around and understood how they are major turning points. So too with our case when I just went over it, it's a few lines in the Bible, and we just mentioned in passing that Moses saw the Egyptian taskmaster of beating the Jewish slave. Now, on one hand you can say very interesting, very nice, and this is a person who cares about another human being, as surely his own people, but it really was a more traumatic effect. Of course, it would be traumatic for anybody to kill another human being and defending them, but this is actually even more traumatic. First of all, a, 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 an Egyptian taskmaster had a lot of power. And even though Mo Moses was a prince in the court at that time, nevertheless, it was a very uh, important, it wasn't just like killing, for example, if he would have killed a slave, no one really would have cared. And this was the, of course, that's, that's not the way today, you can't just kill, if you kill someone homeless or making minimum wage or unemployed, you, you're not allowed to murder them. But again, remember, we're talking over 3,000 years ago, and this was the way of the land, and this is the way that they did things in those days, that a person who was a slave in a low caste, really their life was worthless for all intents and purposes. But instead, Moses killed the taskmaster, and he was a very important person in the Egyptian culture. I mean, he was in charge of the slaves. So therefore, it wasn't an easy decision. I guess for any person, it's not an easy decision to kill someone unless you're person totally insane. But this was an, an act of righteousness, which I don't know how many murders are that way today. Uh, more, they're more violent and criminal. But we can understand that this was a very much of a, a righteous kind of anger that he wanted to uh, uh, kill the taskmaster for beating up and whipping to death the different Egyptian, uh, the Jewish slaves. Uh, this made a very big uh, difference in his life of Moses because you have to understand what, he had a choice. Again, I, I, I stress this out, it's not automatic. People aren't born righteous. Uh, this is an idea, maybe it's, a, it's worth for another show to talk about. It's another topic, the idea of free choice or predestination. And philosophers have chewed over this idea, mulled over this idea for centuries. There's many uh, books written about it. And it's interesting and for a future date to talk about the Jewish perspective of free choice and predestination. But be as it may, let's just say that there is total free choice in Judaism. person is totally accountable for their actions because they're, they're, you're in charge of your own actions and that's it for Moses also. It's, uh, that goes for the most right, it doesn't only go for, so to speak, the middle class, the average person in the street. That goes for the worst criminal, can't say, ah, I couldn't do it, I was a little crazy. There, I mean, well, there, of course, there is an idea that a person uh, may be totally insane that they aren't accountable for their actions and there is in Jewish law, but just to you go around using that as an excuse uh, isn't a proper excuse. A person's accountable for their actions. And then on the other hand goes to the other extreme, which we're talking about. The most righteous person is not born automatically the most righteous person. They had to work and had to make the right choices to become the most righteous. And therefore, that's what I'm trying to bring out to you, that the, uh, there are human feelings and, free, and real choices that everybody has to make, even the most holiest of people. And Moses had to make that choice also, and it was a hard choice. And you can imagine what kind of hard choice it is, uh, using a little bit of imagination, which is what I guess I'm stressing here also. I'm not just saying making up your own story kind of imagination, but uh, there is, I mean, there are books, of course, written, and that's why I'm using that authority. I'm not making up these stories myself, of course. I'm basing them on rabbinical authority. Uh, the legends have come down to us for thousands of years. But on the other hand, that you can't just take it as dry stories. There is more. I mean, for example, uh, again, I mean, maybe we're used to seeing TV and we're used to reading books uh, that would go on for descriptions of an area. Uh, what about Pharaoh's court? They don't say one word how lavish it was, but we have to use some kind of imagination, not total imagination. Of course, there are books and there are paintings of how beautiful these uh, pharaohs and Egyptian courts or maybe other uh, people's courts in the, in the Middle, Age, uh, Middle East at those times, thousands of years ago, so we can have some semblance of the riches and uh, the luxury that these uh, monarchs were living. 
like I say, it's not total imagination, but a little bit more imagination into these details of what was happening there. I mean, you can understand what a beautiful Pharaoh's court was and what kind of life a person would be blessed in the, uh, in, to be born in the upper classes. A little bit we see today, person's father and parents are millionaires. We understand that kind of life they're going to lead, but if it's relevant today, then it's, it's all the more relevant in those days. A person was born into to monarchy, in such a monarchy, not just a little hinky dinky little city state. We're talking about the Egyptian Empire, as we all know, is one of the biggest empires in the world at any world throughout world history. And you're going to be a prince, uh, you have it made. Uh, you're, you're probably the, one of the choicest people in the entire world. And even, maybe we can even say in world history. You're born into one of these monarchs. Uh, you, uh, you can walk around with the respect, with slaves, with anything you can imagine. Total respect, no don't have to work for anything. The total luxury. What I'm trying to bring out to you is that, uh, I know I'm taking time uh, explaining these ideas, but that's what exactly I think is my point right now. That, that there, it isn't so dry to say, oh, Moses came in, and oh, yeah, he wanted to be for the Jews. That isn't so easy to say, because you can imagine, and, and really should take even more, if you read a book, pages, and it should even more details. We don't have the time now, um, and I don't, of course, have every detail how beautiful Pharaoh's court was, but like I say, maybe it'll lead to a little bit of your own imagination. We don't have pictures of it. Uh, some people to have tried drawing, drawings about it, and I have seen it, whether they're totally accurate, I don't know also. But in any case, that here's a person born with, a, as we say in English, a silver spoon born in their mouth, and they're going to be a leader of a race that are totally slaves. And, and we know, really, that Moses' job, even though everybody knows he's famous, he's a leader, a leader's job isn't an easy job. And that's uh, something that we also, maybe we could see in our times, I don't know if it's so important, a president's job, it's not easy. They have to be called on the line if there's a recession and a depression, if there's a war, they're called called upon it, say it's maybe easier to drive a bus. You go up and down the road and drive a bus. Say, oh, the president, oh, hey, look how much money he gets. Look, everybody takes his picture. But there's very uh, big hardships also. A person has to sit down, and they're the real human beings, and they have to make real choices in their life. And they're really called on the carpet more than, than your average person is uh, also. So here, that a Moses, that even though we enamor him, he's a righteous person, person can just take a cursory look into the Bible, and there was many problems that Moses had to go through leading the Jewish people. It's not easy being a leader. He could have been sad and be a prince, and he could have had all the luxury in the world. And that's why I say the turning point of his life was looking at the Egyptian taskmaster beating up that Jewish slave, because that was the major choice in his life. And that was it. Am I going to side with the Egyptians and look the other way against my, uh, my Jewish brethren, and I'm not going to care about what happens to them, but all right, what, that's their problem. And my, my business to enjoy the luxury of the Egyptian court. Or I'm going to say, hey, listen, I'm Jewish. These are my people. Yes, they're slaves, and maybe I, I had a little better fate in my, my childhood. But listen, my lot is with them. I'm a Jewish person. And that's what the choice of Moses had to be at this time. He had to look at the situation. And so who was he going to side with? The Egyptian hierarchy and monarchy, which was foreign to birth to, to him? Or is he going to side with the Jewish slaves, that the people that, that were really his brethren? Well, we know the, the end of the story, so to speak. We know that Moses, of course, killed the Egyptian taskmaster, as I said, and he decided with his Jewish brethren, he had to run away from it. It was a self-sacrifice. It wasn't an easy job, like I said, to kill somebody. I'm sure he didn't enjoy killing anybody, and nobody else would either. It was a righteous kind of anger. And on number two, he almost paid with his life. He had to run away, for, uh, to run away from a death sentence that was put on his head because he had the audacity to kill an Egyptian taskmaster. But I want to bring out to you that there's many uh, human interest stories with uh, which we can look out in these Bible ideas. And again, like I say, I always say, and even though it's 3,300 years old, you can say, what is a 3,300-year-old book going to teach me? But it's something that's the truth, and personality is the truth. Someone 3,000 years said 2 and 2 is equal to 4. Uh, you wouldn't just say, well, they're 3,000 years old. What do I care about that? 
a truth is a true thing. And of course, we have computers today, and we always say we have electricity today. You can say, well, they didn't know about it. They didn't have it in those days. And to say the least, they didn't have these kind of ideas. Nevertheless, when we talk about personality, we talk about looking at yourself as a human being, really, how much have we really changed? We both have a love, and we want to be feared. We, have, uh, we, are, we want to feel important as individuals. We want to be satisfied and fulfilled in life. Really, what has really changed in those days and compared to our days? And don't think that they were so backward either, on the other hand. I mean, of course, like I said, they didn't have the electricity and computers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. On the other hand, that they, they had good food and, all right, they didn't have a microwave oven, so they had slaves in those days to, to cook their food. And just as easy for them to eat as we were to have to eat. And they had a lot of luxuries in those days. And nevertheless, that the personalities probably were very, very much the same, even if you'll say the lifestyles were a little bit different. And the people had to go through the same traumas, the same growing up, and the same maturing, and the same uh, self-realization as they did those days, as they did today. So when we deal with moral and character building up, so really then the Bible, even though it's 3,000 years ago, really is very relevant. And that, I think, is the point of growing up is really the major point. We'll have to come back in another time because there's so many different details in Moses' life for really all the, the, the char Bible characters. We can pick apart their, their, uh, what these stories are uh, that are tell about uh, them and come to a major understanding of what it means. And maybe, like you say, you flip through it in the Bible. I'm saying there's two lines, three lines, and if you just read it through, you're going to flash right through it. Or like I say, you take a novel, and they had through it for 300, 400 pages. You finally get the point. And here you go through two, three sentences. People don't even pick up on it, because by the time they read it, they're, they're gone past into a different story. It's so shorthanded. And really, you don't have those kind of books at all that are read. Maybe every little detail, uh, there, there's every little story they make up for 300, 400 pages. And this is an important point for us, that Moses you know, was born in luxury, was born in materialism, and saw that there was, a higher, there was a higher ethic, there was a higher calling for his life. And that's really in our lives also. Sometimes we have to mature. People may be mature in those days a little earlier. Still, it's around, like I say, around college days. A person comes into 18, 19, 20, the early 20s, and he has to look at themselves, or sometimes it's later. People all the time change, and I always tell them, listen, you know, it's uh, never too late. A person can always change, and people say, today is the first day of the rest of your life. That the person can always look at themselves and say what they're really here for and what they really are meaning for. Of course, no one's saying that person has to kill anybody. God forbid, that's not the proper way. On the other hand, a person has to look at themselves and say, where I'm going to put my cards and where am I going to put my life and what's important to me, um, to me as, uh, as an individual in my own life, as maybe sometimes as making a living, which is important to people. These are other major interests of a person's life. Who they're going to marry. Very important. I think there's a not enough looking into their uh, partner, how important marriage is in their life and how that spouse is going to be so meaningful to their lives. How important, to, in which direction are they going to raise their children? Are These are the major turning points of a person's life. And just like Moses, he had to make major choices. I don't think people today know how to make those major choices and understand the relevancy of those major choices. They just, so to speak, flow through life. And that's like the Pharaoh's court. You can flow through life, and no one's saying you can't. But if you're going to look for some meaning in life, you have to make the choices, and the hard choices many times, and to find some really relevance into, into what you consider important, and what you consider that the major factors in your life, and that's going to make a major bearing on your life and probably for all generations, as we see for Moses as well. So, so it's important, and I hope you enjoy just looking at one, really it's just a few lines in the Bible, but a major character trait of Moses and there's so many more things to talk about we'll have to talk about in the future. But in the meantime, we have enough for you to, to look over and mull over and try to take an important lesson from that. Thank you very much.